what's up everybody welcome back to another highly combustible reaction we're gonna be jumping in the next one on our bum gardener restoration journey you guys asked for it so we're back with another one the savage job part one we're gonna cut it up into two parts 15 minutes a piece one today one tomorrow but it is an amazing thing to watch this man handle a painting he does some things that might make you feel a little nervous for the painting he does some things that might make feel a little gut-wrenching at times but everything always seems to turn out okay he obviously knows what he's doing he's obviously done this a time or two so i'm excited let's jump in let's check it out if you guys enjoyed the content go show him some love on his channel it'll be down inside the description let's roll you know when a seafaring ship sinks it's natural to believe that it's a total loss. I mean, the cargo and the vessel now sit at the bottom of the ocean. True. Yet the ship can be raised. It can be cut apart. It can be recycled. It can be salvaged. Now, when a painting is so thoroughly damaged by an unskilled hand, we must reassess what's possible and also start thinking of salvage. This painting a copy of Van Dyck's famous portrait of the musician Hendrix Liberty, well, it's weathered a tempest or two. After some structural damage, a tear or a puncture, perhaps, it was the subject of a rather aggressive conservation, including a wholesale skinning of the painting. That is, the topmost layer of paint was removed. And if we compare this painting so all right so when he says that that means that there's not going to be any kind of a texture to the painting anymore like no build up of paint no 3d effect because they've skinned that part off of it it talk about it seemed to me like that would destroy the value of a painting for sure but i could be wrong to the original well it's clear just how much damage this has suffered <sighs> just how many elements are missing from this copy. Sure, there are aspects of the painting that are still brilliant, like the hand, which make us wonder if maybe, just maybe, this painting is from Van Dyck's studio. But the face, well, all of the glazes and some of the structure, well, that's gone as well. And that's to say nothing of the coat and background, which have been you reduced can barely to, didn't even see it well a crude uh, underpainting or sketch at best and unfortunately this damage is irreversible there is no way to go back and return what was lost this is permanent aside from the herculean effort it would take to recreate this painting any attempt at doing so would effectively push the conservator into a gray zone of ethics for the repainting, recreation, or forgery of the original, it's something that we cannot do. And no matter how good we are at retouching Van Dyck, we are not. So truth, we have to start thinking about what is possible instead of what isn't. So we must find a way of returning value to this painting, economic, artistic or just emotional, to enable it to have an existence going forward. There must be some way to thread this needle while avoiding the trap of excessive work and interpretive collaboration, yet still affecting positive change and, well, salvaging this once beautiful painting. Van Dyck was so popular during his lifetime that his paintings were coveted all over the world, which led them to be copied by tons of other artists, including a contemporary, friend, and master in his own right, Peter Paul Rubens, a man whose paintings, subject matter, and life itself was, well, larger than life. Not only was Rubens a masterful painter, he was an expert in architecture, art history, 
a collector of artwork, and even a diplomat brokering peace between England and Spain during the Eighty Years' War. But his paintings are really what we focus on most. They're huge. The figures are fleshy and raw, intense. They are quintessentially Baroque. And that seems to have led them to fall out of favor with our modern sensibilities. But if we take a closer look at his work and understand what he was trying to achieve, well, maybe we can see them in a different light and gain a better appreciation and deeper understanding of Peter Paul Rubens. All of this and more will be explored in the documentary Rubens, an extra-large story on Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a new type of streaming service created by filmmakers to showcase some of the most interesting documentaries around. With a catalog of over 3,000 titles from which to choose, there is surely something that will capture your imagination. From history, to science, outer space, the natural world, and even the arts, Magellan has something for you. You can watch on just about any device, your phone, tablet, computer, or even stream to your TV. And the best part? It's completely ad-free. Head over to try.magellantv.com slash Baumgartner Restoration or click the link in the description below to take advantage of this offer and defy your expectations. Because this painting was subject to numerous attempts at conservation, the materials and techniques that were used are unknown. And so it is prudent to take some precautionary measures to protect the painting. A facing of Japanese paper, washikozo, and fish gelatin will ensure that no paint is lost during the removal of the linings and that the paint layer itself is protected during handling. This fish gelatin comes in dried sheets and can easily be dissolved in warm water. This is a food grade fish gelatin, so if one so desired, one could eat said gelatin, though one would certainly need a mint afterwards. Allowing the fish gelatin to dissolve slowly under low heat is absolutely critical to not burning it. Too high of a heat and it will scorch and lose its adhesion properties. Too low and it simply won't dissolve into the water timely. Now once the fish gelatin has fully dissolved into the water and is mixed, it can be removed and taken over to the painting. This fish gelatin has an open time of approximately 10 or 15 minutes, which is plenty of time to apply it to the face of the painting with a bristle brush conveniently labeled fish glue. In this case, I'm using small sections of washikozo as opposed to a large sheet. And I've chosen to use small sections because this is a fairly big painting and it's going to take some time to cover everything. Now that seems contrary to what would be obvious. Big painting, big sheet, easier and faster. Unfortunately, sometimes using a big sheet results in air bubbles in the facing. And to remove those air bubbles requires the overworking of the paper, which can result in its damage. It simply falls apart. So by using smaller sheets, I have a little bit more control and I can ensure that any air bubbles are removed without running risk of damaging or weakening this paper. Because after all, the strength of this paper is what we are after. And if it were damaged or weakened, I would have to add another layer or simply start over. Because this painting is completely free of impasto, it is smooth. That is, there is no yeah, textural see, buildup of did. paint or brushwork or anything else. The application of the adhesive and the paper is relatively easy. It goes on smooth, it can be brushed out, and it can ensure that the bond is very strong. Were there impasto, a different approach might be required because air bubbles signify the lack of adhesion, and that means that the paint layer isn't stabilized and protected. And of course, there is a lot of work that is going to happen to this painting. And making sure that it is absolutely stabilized and protected is the whole point of the facing. So one by one, these squares will be applied. The painting will slowly be covered. And we will say goodbye to this image. Because it will be a long time before we see it again. In fact, by the time this facing is ready to come off, I will have almost forgotten what this painting looks like. Wow. As the adhesive dries, it becomes a little bit more opaque, and the image completely disappears. 
With that adhesive and facing dry, I can now start removing the painting from the stretcher. I'll use two foam blocks on the floor just to make sure that the edge of the painting isn't resting on the concrete and that there is a little cushioning. I could use my feet, but I'd like to keep my shoes clean today. Removing the painting from the stretcher isn't terribly complicated. It's just a matter of pulling out all of the nails and tacks that were used to secure this lining canvas to the wooden support. Really, the only difficult thing is that the entire edge of the painting was wrapped with a water-based paper tape, which was common in yesteryear, but we have now since eschewed, because it serves no purpose and is just excessive. Before I remove the canvas, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I get any errant tacks that I might have missed on the first go-round. This will ensure that the canvas doesn't get hung up and no creases or crinkles or folds happen when I try to remove it. Now, removing the stretcher is as simple as lifting it off and placing it aside. It will need to be clean. He makes everything look so easy, but you know that if you tried this at home, you would just destroy your painting. Don't do that. Call a professional. Call somebody like this man right here if you got a painting that needs some love. Because I'm saying just looking at it gives me the heebie-jeebies. It just makes me kind of weirded out. Like, oh my God, we're doing this to a painting. To be removed. But right now, the focus is on the canvas. And I mentioned that this lining needs to be removed. And so I'm starting to peel back the lining, and... I find something rather interesting. Underneath the canvas lining is a layer of heavy paper, and underneath that paper is another layer of canvas. Oh no. And then we have the original canvas. And this is quite odd. There doesn't seem to be any reason for two layers of canvas and a paper interleaf. I suppose it could make the lining stiffer, but a properly applied lining will be stiff enough, and a second lining isn't necessary. The good news is that the top layer of canvas peels off relatively easily, indicating that the adhesive was, well, not that adhesive. Now, removing the second lining is a little bit more difficult. This adhesive bond was fairly strong, and it will take some elbow grease to get it off. I'm choosing not to wet the canvas because I don't want to introduce any moisture if I don't need to. And I think I can pull back this lining canvas and get it off without any water. I will be so terrified that I was going to rip it something. Going a little bit slower than I had hoped, and it is quite tough. This old rabbit skin glue really did bond well. So, in order to facilitate an easier time for myself, I'm going to clamp the edge of the painting where the canvas has been removed to the table. This will hold the original canvas down and allow me to go to the other side of the table and pull the canvas off without running the risk that the original painting folds or creases or deforms. Also, having two hands pulling as opposed to terrifying, one hand terrifying the business and the other hand pulling will allow me to work faster and it's just much much easier so with the painting secured i can begin really removing this lining canvas now when i said easier i meant easier but not easy because this is still really really hard work it's taking a lot of energy a lot of effort to pull this off and I know what you're thinking, why don't you just wet it and peel it right off? And I could, but then I would have to deal with the consequences of adding moisture to this canvas, which is something that I don't want to do yet. Adding moisture to a canvas introduces Goodness. movement and irregularity and an element of the unknown. We just don't know what's going to happen when a canvas gets wet. And so if we can avoid adding moisture, it is always better. And my efforts, my scraped knuckles and sore hands are just par for the course. If the painting survives, then it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Finally, with the second lining canvas fully removed, sore hands and a few choice words later, I can clean off the residue. But as I come to the corner, I notice something. Another there lining? appears to be a third lining canvas. Because, <laughs> of course there is. 
And so when I thought I was done, I can start all over again, removing this no. from what I think, what I hope is the original. The bond on this canvas is also rabbit skin glue, and it has deteriorated over time, so the canvas can be removed with much more ease than the last one. Unfortunately, this canvas is really brittle, so it does tear in some spots, requiring me to use some tools. Ultimately, however, I think I can get this one off again without adding moisture. Had I used water on the first and second lining canvas? I might have reactivated the adhesive on this lining canvas. Oh my goodness. And maybe not have been able to get this canvas off of the original in time to prevent any distortions. Now, as I remove this lining canvas, the final lining canvas, I can start to see the original and all of the repairs that were executed on it. And this is really what I was looking for, a clue as to what was done. I can see major paper patches applied to the back, indicating that the tears or damage that we could see on the face really oh, did extend. Oh, wow, to the it went all the way through. Sometimes lots of retouching on the face of a painting doesn't indicate any structural failures. But in this case, it seems that that is precisely what has happened. Major damage to the structure of the canvas and, of course, major damage to the image. So right there is where we are going to cut it off for today. We will finish this one up tomorrow. I didn't want to get any too deeper into it just for time's sake. If you guys enjoyed the contents thus far, go over and show Baumgartner Bum Restoration some love on their channel. Hit the like button if you liked it, the dislike button if you decide to check out this other video flowing up on screen or one of these guys up here above me. Tell the next one how they can bust. But you guys be happy, healthy, safe, love you to the moon and back. Peace.